Buenas tardes, vamos a empezar eh, el debate. Eh, vamos a ir moviendo moviéndonos entre el castellano y el inglés, según quien intervenga. El debate es sobre eh, cualidades democráticas en la transformación social. Contaremos con la, con la participación eh, de María Sefidari, que es la, la chair de la Junta de la Fundación Wikimedia, que es una fundación ligada a la Wikipedia, con Claudia eh, Sarají de Composites Collective y por último con Cristian Yayone del LabGov. Yo soy Mayo Fuster, eh, que formo parte de un grupo de investigación en la web que se llama Demons. Para que me, para que me entienda Cristian me voy a, a cambiar al castellano. Eh, so, in, a, in an event about democratic cities it makes a lot of sense to have a session in which to reflect Uh, the democratic qualities of, of, of social transformation and of experiences, like the case of Wikipedia, which is in the field of civil society or in the field of the third sector, which are not the, the, the uh, government institutions, but uh, that are in the uh, uh, civil society dimension. Because uh, the, the same concept of democracy Uh, uh, require to uh, be applied to the whole society, to all dimensions, not only the democracy in terms of which is the model of representative democracy or participative democracy in the um, uh, government uh, uh, institutions, but also how there is democratic qualities in all the uh, spheres, in the family, more de democratic models of family, in the economy, more democratic models of economic production. Actually, Wikipedia could be seen as a, as a mode of economic production too. Or in the association, foundation, or civil society, how far they also uh, have democratic qualities, uh, have also uh, um, uh, challenges uh, uh, in their own models. And, uh, and uh, from this perspective, uh, uh, this table wants to reflect about uh, uh, democratic qualities in this field of uh, civil society, first. But second, how far these um, uh, models of, go of uh, govern gover governance or uh, mechanisms of decision making which are uh, uh, emerging in civil society, particularly in the connected to Uh, innovation emerging from the adoption of ICT could actually be a, uh, an inspirational source to rethink the democratic government in political institutions. Uh, and in, from this uh, double perspective of democratic qualities in civil society, but also how far they can uh, inspire or, or not, or they might not be a good model for uh, reflecting the government institutions. So from this um, uh, double approach, first I would like to uh, ask um, uh, the participants uh, which is the democratic qualities and the challenges uh, from this perspective they would uh, reflect or they would uh, highlight from the experiences they, they are part of. I, I would ask first to answer uh, Maria and Claudia and Claudia, and then uh, Christian. Of course. Thank you, Mayo. Um, so I would say, first of all, everyone is familiar with Wikipedia, right? Um, most people have uh, read an article at one point or another. Less people have done the extra step of editing an article and adding information, and even less people have participated to construct the rules that govern the encyclopedia, right? Less people are less familiar of how those communities are self-organizing. Uh, I think we could say that Wikipedia has uh, quite a bit to say about uh, governance in the digital landscape in the sense of I think a very important quality is, uh, of course, the open participation. Anyone can participate in Wikipedia. Uh, you are not even required to, have a, to register an account. You can do it anonymously. You can start participating, and you can have a voice 
uh, in how the, the, the project is, is built. And you can do that in your own language even. There's more than 300 projects. So you can be a part of any of those communities. I think one of the challenges is that it does take a while to learn how that uh, prospective community um, self-governs, right? Uh, how to participate in a way that's constructive. And of course, any challenge that any community has is to be aware of their own gaps, right? Be aware of um, the biases that you might be creating or constructing. Um, I think one of the, uh, probably the most well-known challenge that we have at Wikipedia is uh, the gender gap, for example. I would not say Wikipedia is democratic because we know we have only a 10% approximately uh, number of women participating, and that's very low. You cannot say you have a democracy when that is the issue. Why does that happen when in theory, you know, it's open, anyone can participate? Well, because we are replicating some of society's uh, problems in the sense of we do have biases. We do have biases that are restricting participation both by women and minorities. And we need to fix that. Um, everything in Wikipedia is public. That's another important quality um, in a way that everything is absolutely transparent. Uh, we try to be as accountable as possible so that everyone can see where everything is coming from. But those same mechanisms allow bias to be introduced. And obviously, it's making people participate less. So how do we fix that? That's one of the biggest uh, challenges we're facing in our uh, ongoing uh, strategy process, in which we're right now currently engaged, uh, thinking ahead for the year 2030. How do we fix those elements so that we can fix our internal governance and everyone can participate and build uh, knowledge for all? Because th this is a... And excuse me for the little self-promotion, right? But the glorious thing about Wikipedia is that this is the first time in history that everyone has a chance to participate in the collective creation of history. That's something that was only reserved for the elite if, of North America and Europe uh, until very, very recently. This is an, uh, an opportunity for everyone to tell their stories, to tell their history, to participate and build collectively an enormous source of knowledge for everyone in the world. And we do not want to fail in this mission. So in conclusion, so I can let my, my fellow colleagues uh, speak a little bit. Um, I think there are very important um, democratic elements in Wikipedia. We have a saying, an internal saying, we are not a democracy. Uh, we try to build things by consensus and we want to be as inclusive as possible. I think that's one of the greatest challenges in any governance system. How do you make sure that people can have a voice, that you just are not guided by a majority, because a majority can be guided by bias, but you are as inclusive of everyone as you can possibly be. Um, I absolutely agree with you. That great Donna Haraway quote around matters what stories tell stories. Um, so for me, this is a really like, heartfelt panel because it relates a lot to how I view and divide my work. Um, on one end, I do research and look at participation, usually at the city level, at the, at the municipality level. Um, and especially the last couple of years, I've been heavily focused in Taiwan. But what I do is I apply it inside organizations, because at least um, in the context of, of the United States and a lot of my work there is that I don't think we're ready to, like we would be ready to know how to act in, in a participatory way. Um, and so for me, organizations provide that context so that we can learn these tools, learn these techniques, learn these ways of working, um, and actually really like build those values so that when we have an opportunity at our community level to go, you know, be it like participatory budgeting or even further steps down the line into like crowd, uh, crowd law creation or co-creation, we actually know, know how to do that. Uh, because interestingly enough, I, I think that many orgs internally replicate some of the power structures and dynamics that we're trying to, to replace. Um, so when I think about some of these sort of like democratic qualities that are important, um, one, I'm really moved, especially by the work in, in Taiwan and Audrey Tang in this, in this uh, call for like freedom and remembering that freedom is something that, we're, that, we must, that we must fight for. And so this goes down to me, even to like our own internal software choices and, and the tools that we're using internally, right? Like, um, what, uh, how, 
I guess like how we, we must model what we want to see. Um, some other qualities that, that I think are really important. Um, one is this embrace of complexity, um, taking a, a more of a systems look at what we're solving. And it's not, not just simple pieces here and there, but really that, that whole look at the system. Um, I think experimentation is incredibly important uh, because we're all learning about this right now. And what might work in one context isn't necessarily going to, to work in the other. So experimentation and an openness. Um, and perhaps one of, the, one of the hardest things that I think we're going to have to do is, is listen and listen across the divide and, listen and learn to listen to each other, um, which as, a, as someone who's a facilitator, I think this is the, that magical thing that you're striving for is like when we start listening to each other, when we really hear those differences and really embrace the plurality of our spaces, uh, we start to come up with really interesting ideas and we can start to work with each other um, in a more productive way. Alexis? So you mentioned the uh, concept of uh, quality of democracy and, and and, and so this reminds me of the fact that uh, the quality of democracy can have many dimensions. And on this basic insight, which is uh, rooted in the, in, in the theory of the quality of, dem of democracy, what we started uh, a few years ago was to understand how to inject in the uh, measurement of the quality of democracy the pos a new dimension. A dimension that would put, uh, uh, in our case, being the unit of analysis, the city, the uh, possibility for local communities, city inhabitants, to uh, be part of the governance of the city. And, and so this dimension, you know, of course, by building on, on the intersection between the theory of democracy, of quality of democracy, and the theory of the governance of the commons, especially the literature on, uh, on, uh, of Elinor Ostrom, uh, with, with Sheila Foster, uh, we started these uh, experimentation projects and then uh, an empirical analysis of all these policies, regulations, projects, which in cities are trying to uh, create a, a legal framework, uh, are trying to award rights, to recognize rights to local communities and city inhabitants in the uh, use, management, ownership, of assets, infrastructures, services. So the basic insight was enough with this idea of public-private partnerships. Let's try to understand if we can create a legal uh, framework that would enable public community partnerships so that City, Go City Hall can mm, create new forms of alliances uh, that are recognized by the legal system as forms of uh, cooperation between those who want to act, to take collective action in, uh, in the city and, and city hall. The challenges. The first one is the, the culture inside city hall. It's not easy to find in uh, public authorities. It's easier at the city level, that's for sure. I would never have started uh, something like that at the national level. Bu national bureaucracies, I kind of say, are doomed because they work uh, within a different uh, 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 institutional paradigm, which is based on command and control or you know, the idea of uh, providing. And, but in any case, city officials uh, usually need to uh, also go through uh, sort of cultural shift. This is, of course, enabled uh, by, by a strong political support. Uh, definitely, you know, what happened in Barcelona is uh, a worldwide example. Uh, but there are other cities in, in, in Europe, like Madrid, like Naples, like uh, Bologna, like uh, Turin, uh, uh, Amsterdam, and you, you can name Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, my colleague Foster is now working in, in Baton Rouge and then in, in New York City as well. So this is important. The, so the, the first thing is the institutional, uh, the institutional culture inside the city hall. Uh, Madison, 
Wisconsin is another city in the, in the US that uh, is, is a lighthouse city for this kind of approaches. Going back to Europe, the other question is cultural culture in, in the European Union. The EU institutions could do a lot to enable city authorities uh, uh, create this kind of partnerships, this kind of uh, uh, forms of cooperation. The second challenge is, of course, uh, the need for city inhabitants and local communities uh, for skills, for you know, uh, knowledge. Uh, and I talk especially for, for Europe, because I know that in the US is, uh, there is uh, you know, an ecosystem of uh, actors that uh, work with uh, local communities. Community organizing is a big issue in, uh, in the US. There are training programs, there are uh, uh, graduation programs, there are institutions that uh, run these kind of programs. But the point is that uh, to be a partner, to be a, a cooperator with public authorities takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of uh, skills. So we need to provide uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of you know, tools to, uh, to local communities and city inhabitants that want to take this, this collective action in cities. The last point, which is the key point, the most first, maybe critical point, the one I'm working on uh, currently, is access to finance. In the end, it all comes down to money and to get the right finance in the proper hands. The other, you know, the, the private sector, the, even the third sector has been able to create forms of financing. We need to start thinking about uh, uh, new financing schemes that can really enable and uh, um, put uh, the resources in the hands of uh, this kind of uh, uh, Entrepreneurs, I would call them civic entrepreneurs. I think that they are as much as uh, public authorities working in the, in the general interest, but uh, with the more entrepreneurial approach because they are taking a risk, which is something that maybe usually public authorities don't do because they, don't, they are not supposed to do. Actually, those who take risks, they are the public authorities that also uh, have more success, but usually public authorities are risk averse. And so they, they're less entrepreneurial than, so civic entrepreneurs like, uh, like you know, we, we are used to call them commoners. And they, when they really want to take a risk, then they, 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 they succeed. But of course, they need to have uh, a texture and they need to have uh, a supporting system and financial, financial support is one of the key resources they need to have access to. Um, connecting some of the uh, uh, reflections that you have uh, pointed out, I would like to refer to uh, an encounter that uh, happened uh, uh, one week ago here. It was the Schengen City Summit, which was an encounter of cities that in line of what uh, 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 Yayone, Professor Yayone has uh, pointed out, uh, are cities that are uh, uh, aiming to take advantage of the new technologies, particularly uh, platform uh, type of uh, interactions uh, in order to uh, foster the economical development of the cities. No? And it was uh, 50 cities and it ended up with a declaration. And in this uh, declaration, on the one hand, it was important to differentiate the, the models of, of platform, no? uh, to put it very simple. Uber is, very, is a platform, Wikipedia is a platform, but they are very different. And you could even say that both are open. So here we, you have referred, Maria, to the challenges of openness in the sense of openness might also reproduce uh, biases in society and uh, not necessarily might end up into uh, an inclusive uh, uh, process. Uh, but open, openness or even collaboration not necessarily assure a democratic uh, model. Not at all. I mean, um, I think we, we, we do need to differentiate between an open model and one that allows itself to be served for exploitative purposes. I think that the key difference is uh, whether you care about your community or not, whether you want to nurture them and allow them, uh, empower them in a sense, right? And I think it's really easy to see uh, even though a lot of platforms might want to call themselves open, 
I think it's, it's really easy to see once you get down to the community if they're feeling supported or if they're feeling exploited. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to be very vigilant uh, because sometimes in the name of something being branded as collaborative, uh, we're actually seeing a reduction of the uh, user rights or protection rights for certain communities. And uh, I think organizations um, need to be accountable to their communities, right? Um, I, I can talk about my own example, right? Uh, again, everyone is familiar with Wikipedia. Less people are familiar with Wikimedia, which is the movement that was sparked by the projects by all the different communities. And from Wikimedia came the Wikimedia Foundation that operates all the projects. One of the biggest concerns right from the start was how are we accountable to the communities? How in this international movement, how do we give them a voice so that they can express uh, their concerns and their uh, challenges and how they need us to support us. And of course, I'm not saying that we have a perfect model, not at all, but some of the key elements or our key values, and of course transparency is one of the biggest, like we, we have our, 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 all of our discussions are, are public. We have open mailing lists, we have the open wikis, of course, and places for public debate. And we try to encourage people um, to, to come, to add those new voices that we knew we are missing. And we have a lot of uh, conferences, right? But as well, we also devised a, a system in which that, those communities could be represented on the board of directors of the Wikimedia Foundation, right? Which is something you're not gonna see in platforms like Uber or you know, Twitter or Facebook. You're not gonna see those users uh, as stakeholders, as uh, people with a voice and a vote on the direction that an organization is going to see. And I think that's something that's really, really important. Um, just like, I mean, you, you could have a, a hospital board of directors, and I believe you should have doctors. I think you, you, ha you need to have community members uh, as the experts on of how your product uh, is working or not working for them, and to take into account their, their sensibilities and their concerns. Um, granted, uh, there's many ways to, um, um, improve those processes. Um, there's no perfect process. And of course, we have to account for bias again um, because we don't want to replicate some of the issues and challenges of real life in which, uh, going back to the gender gap, women have more problems ac accessing leadership positions, right? Um, but that's something that we have tackled much more su successfully offline than online. We have a lot of our um, affiliates, Wikimedia affiliates around the world, and the proportion of women in leadership posi positions is actually pretty high. So we are cautiously optimistic that, you know, we believe in, in, in governance uh, that can have a community perspective and a community voice and vote. And we believe that's actually pretty important. If you want to have a, a successful um, project or product in which you are you are so completely dependent on a community. You have to take care of your community and you have to allow them, um, not, uh, let me not use the word allow, but you have to make sure you have mechanisms so that they can have a voice and a vote. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I would disagree that Uber is an open platform. And I think that by calling it an open platform and by calling things like Gmail free, we enter into this quagmire where most of society doesn't realize that, that they've paid heavily for that, for that cost of you know, free, free software or free open, because it, it's just not. And so I think that um, we can't call it that and maybe we need another term. And what we need to do is really be like very firm about what these definitions mean because I think they're gonna hurt the other side, which is actual like free software. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 we need a word for these platform capitalistic uh, structures that are that are really causing a lot of a lot of harm and damage um, to this movement. So, so <clears throat> the word itself, open, is not normative enough because open can be open to anybody, to everybody, to also the kind of actors that are self interested. That are egoistic, and we, which is fine, you know. It's it, but it's something different. So, if you want to be normative and 
in, in a good sense, in the sense that, of course, the, the approach of at least the things that we are trying to do is to, to bring more social justice and more democracy to the city. Well, you need to be to add something to the, the openness. That, uh, that openness to whom, I would say. And because, you know, open innovation, for instance, has been another uh, Trojan horse for uh, uh, new uh, kind of uh, uh, agglomerations or concentrations of powers. And if you want to distribute power, then uh, openness is not enough. So that's why I prefer open and maybe also collective, or maybe better collective than open, which means that you kind of recreate. I don't want to say that you need to be closed, of course, but you do need to reserve. You do need to give some preferential treatment to uh, some forms of these co collective actions, of cooperative actions, in, in my case, in the city, because that's how you can create the space, the room in the city for economic diversity. Because what we have been listening to in the previous panel is basically that. I, I liked uh, when, when Rukia mentioned, well, you know, political activity is fighting neighborhood by neighborhood to bring basically new services, new opportunities, new jobs, new skills to the people that are in need. Because as Anna Arendt would say, there is no freedom without liberation. There is no liberty without liberation. If you are not free from need, you cannot exercise your political uh, liberties. So that, that's what I think it's why I, you know, learning from, again, Barcelona, Madison, Jackson, Mississippi, I think that uh, it, it's always in more important, not more important, I would say that uh, it's logically antecedent to have economic cooperation, economic action to create this economic diversity in the city that then influence the political process. And, you know, if you look at these, uh, these, at least these three cities, and also, you know, cities like uh, uh, that I mentioned before, you realize that this was uh, the kind of narrative that uh, is behind. Yeah, I, I would go a bit even, like, uh, building on, on your true, in, uh, on your uh, interventions, I would perhaps even go a bit further, saying it's not that open is not uh, enough, like, normative or that we need another another term like one term in the sense of don't use a collaborative economy to refer to uber because collaborative economy could be all, only wikipedia and you and use platform economy for uber you know i think we are in a moment uh, so rich and complex at the same time in which we cannot have one single term or we cannot have even and one single conception of democracy. And this is what I see value of this debate today about qualities of democracy. Because I think we are in a moment in which there is a confluence of the several trajectories uh, aiming to bring uh, democratic uh, organizing. So you have the perspective of inside of the commons, you have the perspective of Ostrom and the uh, quality of democracy as having a governance modality of the collective which assure uh, uh, a, a, a good decision making, no? which connect well with the cooperativism trajectory. No? But then you have also the perspective of quality of democracy connecting with what Maria has said in terms of, yeah, but it has to be accessible. It has to be, you know, uh, quality of democracy as you are producing something like the Wikipedia, which is accessible for everyone. You know? So the, the, here it's another conception of, of, of democracy in which decision making and systems of governance is not enough, but at the end the results have to be accessible for all. No? Or you have the conception of democracy of, of uh, uh, being socially responsible, being inclusive, or the conception of democracy about ba being based of a technology which assures transparency and a set of rights. So in this sense, I think we are in this moment of a very rich confluence of different trajectories of conceptions of democracy, and uh, particularly, and, and it's difficult to just fix it into a term, but it's important that we keep in this process of trying to understand each other, the value of the conception of democracy of each other, and trying to communicate it 
to the cities in order to, to cities in line with what uh, you were saying could do a com public commons partnership or, or public uh, mm -hmm. community uh, partnership with the, with those who has these quali qualities and be able to differentiate with those which are not. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I agree with you. I, I don't think we're going to have one term, right? I, and I, one of the things I started out by saying is that we have to embrace the complexity, and the complexity is many, right? It's plurality. And I think what we need are definitions. And so or when, when we speak, we have to be clear about what we, what we mean, right? So what does open mean to, to me or to you or to someone else? And, and I think when you're, when you're clear about that, like that, that helps set that ground for, for discussion. I, I mean, I think we need to move away from this idea of the reductionist, like the one, the one solution for all. Um, we need to embrace management of complexity, and that's where I think technology comes into play because it's going to help us manage that complexity. Um, just like, you know, multilingual languages, like we're 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 at a point where in in a few years, like these conversations could be happening with translations in our ears at a faster rate, or just speaking to like, who who knows where we're going to go here? I mean, I think it's I think it's about embracing that plurality. If there is, uh, I will give the floor to the um, audience if there is uh, some questions for the debate. Yeah, there is a question. Hi, thank you all. Really appreciate the conversation. Um, are, what are some uh, new uh, technologies of open, uh, open technologies that you would recommend for people to begin to exploring or ideas of, of, of such, like ideas that are almost here, like they're coming, like they just haven't been released or something like that. Does that make sense? Do you all know any? <clears throat> I mean, there's a, there's a lot. Again, I think this gets down to the like, is there, there's no, there's things that are trying to be like, bigger like, packages that can solve more, such as like today we had the jam for, for the see them, there's console, but then there's, like I, I've been studying the Taiwan process, which is actually like an accumulation of technologies. The one thing is that they, in Taiwan, they will only use like free, free tools to get over this issue of cost, right? For them, it's like there is, there is another cost to that, uh, which we can talk about how they actually like have, get the developers to do that, but it's so that there is no cost. Uh, at, at the core. So I think it really, I mean, I'd be happy to talk, talk with you afterwards because I think there's a, there's a range of stuff. And again, if we, if we go back to this term of thinking about complexity, it's going to be about looking at your needs and figuring out what you might need in that moment, but then also being open, as I mentioned early, to experimentation, to like growing as, and changing as it moves forward. Um, so that's... Yeah. Good. No, good. Yeah, um, this is something we've been studying at Wikimedia because... We are a global movement, right? And the needs uh, of one region might not be the needs of another. We've seen this, like there are some communities that love to use IRC to communicate and to decide and to just chat with each other. And there are other communities that prefer Telegram or Signal. And of course, speaking sometimes the same language, technologically speaking, is just not gonna be possible uh, for cultural reasons or for many other valid, very valid reasons. So. Right now, at the, the, our current stage of evolution, what we want is people to start uh, at least talking inside their communities, right? Like, we do want, uh, for example, in, in, in areas in which, or regions where we've had less presence, uh, if they find something that works for them, fantastic. It can be Telegram, it can be Slack, or it can be any other means of communication. What we care about is that later those decisions or those conversations can join the global conversation. And right now, the way we do that is uh, with uh, in-person conferences. And no doubt there's better ways to do that, but right now we're at that stage of trying to empower every single uh, regional um, community to have those conversations between themselves, because that's already a, a very big step of just having uh, voices in the global north. So once we have everyone in the global conversation, then we can figure out how do we improve, how do we make it more efficient? Can we speak the same language? Uh, that would be fantastic. I cannot wait until we have those translation <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, items because that would be so incredible, incredibly helpful. 
um, because, again, and language is an issue, of course. Uh, if English or Spanish is our common vehicle uh, at conferences, that's also a huge barrier of entry, right? Uh, it, it requires that people speak one of the main languages just to participate, and then they have to go back to their community and relay there. And we are aware of this. We're trying to figure out a sustainable way to fight it, but of course we are aware that that's an incredible barrier right now. I just want to add a little bit to that, which I think is interesting, which I think will be a challenge for technology nowadays, will be creating interoperability. That is to say, like, you can be on Telegram and you can be where you want to be and we can get this information, like, shared between us. Um, so right now, what I usually recommend is, like, processes for documenting, right? So if those communities chat where they chat, that information is documented and then shared to the larger community in, in a way that is a little more standardized so you know what's going on. Um, but I think there are some really interesting strides. Like I've been studying this, this group in Taiwan for two years, and for a while you'd get into the main Slack channel and it's all in Mandarin. And then someone was like, wait, we don't need this. We could actually just start using the Google API and simul like translating these channels. So now we have a main channel that is interoperably translated with the Google API with its you know imperfections and being Google, but it goes from Mandarin to Japanese, Mandarin to English, uh, Mandarin to Korean, and you can just add more to it. And this is going to allow this community that started in Taiwan to now have more connections. So I think also we like, how do we make these systems more interoperable will be huge for those for those who are technologists in the I, future. I hear you on that one because like I currently have like 10 or 11 apps that are just for speaking with different communities because some of them prefer Signal because of privacy concerns and some of them prefer Facebook because it's what they use in the region and so I have to have these apps and it can get a little bit overwhelming at times but uh, that's the current situation right now. You cannot tell a community, no, do not use this or that. That's, that's not how it works. Right. You have an easier time going and being like, okay, this is what you use. Like, here's how we can build in some other connection pieces or here's this other layer, right? Because there's a Slack to Telegram. So there's like a little connection. There's also bridging between different Slacks. So you don't have to be a member of 500 Slacks. You can have like a shared room. So yeah, I agree with you. You can't go in and be like, no, I'm going to wipe this out, uh, which goes to that like understanding what those needs are and then helping people get there over time. My experience with the technology and digital platform, again, being it rooted in the urban uh, context is very much linked to, on one side, to the automation of uh, the creation of these partnerships, these pacts of collaboration. Uh, in particular, this is happening in, uh, in Turin. So the, the, the city of Turin is building a platform to make sure that uh, the creation of these contracts is automized, automatized. The other thing is that in Rome, we are working on, on uh, digital platforms that would put in the hands of uh, local communities uh, the right to start uh, uh, energy communities, uh, Wi-Fi communities, so that they can provide services, technological services, uh, to, the, uh, to the inhabitants of these neighborhoods. Actually, in Reggio Emilia, in one city is already implemented in one neighborhood, and we are expanding this to other neighborhoods and creating a foundation for social and digital innovation that will you know, increase this, uh, this approach that we call the, the tech justice. The idea to bring technological justice in underserved and distressed neighborhoods or cities, but with the idea, again, that it's collective, collectively managed, the platform, and locally produced. Uh, the platform to manage this kind of services and, and assets. Okay. Uh, well, we have for a super short question because it's already six. I'll make it super short. Uh, okay. okay, I'll make it super short. Um, we're talking more, uh, more and more about building the skills uh, uh, that are necessary to participate in a real democracy. How do we um, register the evolution of this skill building uh, process? How do we have a narrative to tell that the, these skills are evolving and are um, increasing? How do we... Uh, other than through the result of the participation. 
So is the question, how do we, how do we know we're actually like building the capacity and the skill set, the, yeah. the correct skill set? Oof. <laughs> it's a great question. It is. I mean, I, I guess you could look at the outcome, right? Like, if you do have a more, much more diverse um, representation of, of, of people participating, I think you're being successful if you have more people. It's not just about quantity, it's also about quality. Uh, if you have X number of more people participating, but it's the exact same group of people that has always participated, you're not making much progress in a very important sense of the word. So, I think in any democratic process, inclusiveness is key. It's not just about accessibility, that's important, uh, but also who is accessing. And then, of course, empower those people that once they're there, but they do matters, that they actually uh, are changing things and have the ability to change things, which is what uh, makes people feel empowered and continue participating. Okay. So uh, thank you, the three of us, for participating. And uh, um, now I think there is a, a moment for coffee break. 30 minutes for coffee break, and then there is more uh, debates and, and good content. Thank you. Thank you.